will serve and I will serve no foreign God nor any other treasure and you are my heart's desire oh spirit without measure unto Lord, your word says that we are the ones that bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And Lord, sometimes the sacrifice is just praising you, Lord, in the storm, Lord, praising you in those seasons of life that uh, are more difficult, Lord. But Lord, they're, they're just as sweet, Lord, in you. They don't make any less less importance in your eyes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You're so faithful.
anchor of my soul. I'm overwhelmed by all you are. Oh, how I love you. Jesus, the anthem of my heart. Jesus, the anchor of my soul.
we're so grateful, Lord, that you are here, Lord, and that, Lord, you hear our voice, Lord, you hear our cry of our heart, Lord, and Lord, that we can have your presence here tonight, Lord. Receive our worship, Lord, receive our praise, Lord, and prepare our hearts for the teaching of your word, Lord God, that we might receive all that you have for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We'll sing a, a, a verse or two of uh, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So love he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atoned. taught us great things he hath done and great our rejoicing through jesus the son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when jesus we see praise the lord praise the lord let the earth The people rejoice, O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice, O oh, come to the Father through Jesus. He said, Amen. Amen. Let's say hello to one another.
interesting. Uh, you're already in trouble, so you can uh, you can you can choose to sit down so you get out of trouble, but you're in trouble already. For all right, let's uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day, and we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. And uh, Lord, we want to just lift this time of study in your word and ask you would anoint it by your Holy Spirit. Speak to us, Lord. Teach us the things that we need to, to know today. And Lord, for those who um, are having issues right now, whether it be health or uh, whatever it may be, we just pray and lift them before your throne of grace. Um, Lord, there are several people that I can think of right now that need that. And so we pray, touch them and, and heal and give peace and strength and comfort. Lord, we love you, and we praise you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Everyone want to sign? Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to be in the book of Galatians. That's where we're going. When you look over in the book of Acts, it, it gives us a, a lot of information about the churches being established in Galatia uh, by the Apostle Paul in chapters 13 and 14. We see that. Uh, false teachers uh, enter into the churches sometime after Paul's departure, after he had left them there. And Paul writes the letter to the Galatians around 48 AD. Uh, that's an approximate time and prompted by this news of false teaching that had crept in. So when you look at Galatians, uh, you can actually look back into Paul's life as he's going to take us uh, into his conversion uh, and the times when he had, uh, was in this area establishing the churches. And you can find it, um, direct correlations in the book of Acts. You have Paul's conversion uh, that we'll read here in verses 12 through 17 of chapter 1. You find that in uh, Acts chapter 9. Also, uh, Paul's first visit to Jerusalem, uh, we'll see here in chapter 1, verses 18 through 24, but it's also found in Acts 9, 26 through 30. And then um, Paul's second visit to Jerusalem, and we'll see that next week as we get into chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, but you see it in Acts 27 through 30. And then Paul's confrontation with Peter in Antioch, and you find that in Galatians 2, 11, 14, but there is no correlation, no, uh, nothing recorded in the book of Acts of that whole thing. And so it kind of is reflected when the, in the Acts timeline about all these different things that Paul is going to be sharing with us here in the book of Galatians. Uh, like I said, he recounts his um, conversion, his first visit to Jerusalem, his second visit to Jerusalem. Uh, also, um, uh, Paul plants the churches of Galatia on his first missionary journey, and that's recorded in Acts 13 and 14 in Antioch, uh, Antioch and Pisidia. Uh, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. These are towns that you're going to uh, be familiar with as we go through the book of Galatians. Paul's confrontation with Peter in Antioch, uh, like I had said. Also, uh, Paul's return to Antioch, which you'll find in chapter 15, verse 2, uh, or I'm sorry, Acts 14, 26. Uh, and then in Acts 15, 2, you have the Jerusalem Council. And then Paul writes his letter to the Galatians around 48 AD after Paul's confrontation with Peter and before the Jerusalem Council. So it just kind of gives you a, a timeline to look at. Uh, the Jerusalem Council 
which is recorded in Acts 15, 1 through 35, occurring after Paul wrote Galatians. And this council officially resolved the questions at issue in Galatia. So I'll get there in a second so that you know, when we look at the theme, the purpose of the letter. But first, I want to show you a map. I want to show you a map. <laughs> okay, so I don't want to show you a map. Daniel wants to show you a map. <laughs> and this is, you see right up there in the very top towards the left, it says Galatia. Uh, that is a region, okay, and that's why we'll see as we open up the letter, it says to the churches in Galatia. So there were several that were, that were there in Iconium, Lystra, uh, Derby, all around in that area. Paul had gone there and he had established churches. Also in Antioch, Pisidia, which is to the north. Now there's two different Antiochs that are here. You'll see one down uh, over to the right and down a little ways. It's Antioch, Syria. That's where the letter's written from, not Antioch, Pisidia. So uh, there's, I think, one other Antioch in the Roman Empire as well. And of course, it was named after uh, the Caesar. Uh, and so they would establish, you know, just like you have uh, Caesarea Philippi. That's uh, Philippi of Caesar is what that is. And so they would name towns after uh, those who were the, the rulers and such. That area that you see there in Galatia, uh, and in Cappadocia, Lycia, uh, Derby, all these areas that you see here, all the way over to Antioch, Syria, uh, that, that is where the modern day Turkey is. Uh, I've, been, I've been really dying to teach a book that deals with the, the area of Turkey. Having gone there now, man, I tell you, this, it's so rich for me to see this. Uh, just a little side note real quick is, as we're looking at this and uh, you see where At uh, Atalea is and Pergia uh, and Myra, well down and to the right would be where Ephesus is. Uh, so these communities that uh, are in Galatia are on one side of the mountain range and Ephesus and Pergia and all these and, and actually, if you go north of Pergia, then you get into uh, Smyrna and, and the, where the seven churches are and that kind of thing. There's a huge mountain range that is there. So when you think about this and you think in, of Paul, you know, traveling around, don't think it's like he walked down through the Sacramento Valley. Think like this, he walked over the Sierras. The mountain range has over 12,500 foot peaks in the mountains. They're huge. And they have the same kind of, of weather that we have here in our um, Sierras as well. They're snow capped. I mean, it, it, to me, it was very fascinating when I, I was totally shocked by the topography of Turkey. I didn't expect that. And in the area where Galatia is, where Iconium and Lystra is, that is an extremely fertile valley. A lot of the produce and vegetables and stuff uh, that are, uh, that Turkey has are grown in that area. So it's really a very beautiful place. Uh, I expected it to be one big desert, but it was not that at all. And so I was pleasantly surprised. So that kind of gives you an idea of the area that we're talking about when we're saying, you know, that Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia. They would have been the churches of Lystra, Iconium, and Derby, and the areas over in uh, the churches in that area. The letter uh, uh, Galatia had two meetings uh, when the epistle was written. First it referred to an area in Asia Minor where the Gauls had settled after migrating from Western Europe through Italy and Greece. The Gauls were the Celts. So like I said Sunday, these are my people, you know. Uh, and uh, anyways, that's where they had settled. The territory was limited to the north central and east central areas of Asia Minor. That whole area that you're looking at up there, that is Asia Minor. Uh, and so there was a lot of activity, of course, that was taking place there. Um, and its principal cities were Ankara, uh, Pessinus, and Tavium. 
but in 25 BC, this kingdom was converted to a Roman province and territory was added to the south, including the cities of Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And you see the Antioch of Pisidia, uh, which is what that's talking about, which is up there. So, the time and the place of the writing, well, like I said, it was written from Antioch of Syria, uh, about 48 uh, AD, or, yeah, 48 AD, uh, just before the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. In chapters one and two, Paul will describe his experience in regards to the grace of God. In chapters three and four, the doctrine in regards to the grace of God and in five and six, application in regards to the grace of God. The theme of this book is saved by grace alone. And uh, it is known as the smaller version of Romans. Martin Luther taught it extensively and the common people of his day read it for their own use. Paul was the apostle of grace over 120 times in his epistles he uses the word grace more than any other writer in the New Testament. Understandably so, he consented to the stoning of Stephen. He was a man who was willing to go 130 miles out of his way to persecute those who were of this sect known as the Christians. In 1 Timothy 1.13, it says, although, speaking of Paul himself, he says, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in belief, in unbelief. So Paul has that, with that in his heart, that whole idea of grace, saved by grace through faith. And he's really the strongest proponent of that in the New Testament. On the road to Damascus, Saul of Tarsus met Jesus and became the Apostle Paul, as we know. Uh, he had three days in which he was blind to the world, but his eyes were open to the grace of God. His very radical conversion to Christ was such an example of grace that it is no wonder that grace would be the emphasis of his ministry. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 7 and verse 47, it says, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And you know, the Lord is talking about, uh, for those who have experienced the grace of God, especially in the depths like what Saul did, and he realizes how, uh, what he was, he refers to himself as a, as a murderer, as a blasphemer, as a persecutor, all these things. And it, that's not just trite little sayings for him. He realized who he was, and he realizes that God has forgiven him, and that God turned his life around. And, and gave him a life that uh, would be one that would be used for his glory. Um, and he says that he did that because God did that because he did it in ignorance. He, and it truly was. His heart was in the right place. He wanted to serve God. He wanted to know God. But the problem was he was so caught up, of course, in Judaism that he could not, he could not see it. He couldn't see it. And so here lies the problem, of course, in the churches in Galatia is that the Judaizers are coming in. And they are coming behind Paul, and they're telling them, okay, now that you've received Christ, there's a little more to it than that. Now you have to be circumcised. You have to observe the law. You have to observe the moons and the feast and all these things. And so Paul is going to be dealing with that directly. And we'll see in, in the very beginning of his epistle here that it is devoid of that typical con uh, com commendation that Paul starts his letters out with. Usually, you know, he starts out with a commendation of, of, to those that it's being written to. Here, he does it. He, I mean, and he even did it with the Corinthians, um, that God, even though they were guilty of gross sins, Paul still had done that. But this shows us the intensity of this letter. Paul will get right to the point and will hold nothing back. There is difficulties that are going on, and, and Paul, rightfully, rightfully so, is very upset about it. So, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So, the Judaizers in Galatia both discredited Paul 
and proclaimed a false gospel. Those are the two things that they were doing. It was necessary that Paul vindicate his apostleship and message as a, a task he undertook, he undertakes in the first two chapters of Galatians. Um, Weist on this opening where it says Paul an apostle as he says the word apostle as Paul uses it here does not merely refer to one who has a message to announce but to an appointed representative with an official status who is provided with the credentials of his office so Paul immediately he's defending his position as to who he is and what he is called to and we're going to see as we go through chapter one he makes sure that, the, that we and the readers of the epistle, which would have been one that would have been passed around to all the churches, that they make, he makes sure that they understand that this wasn't through any man, that it was through God and God alone. Because there were those that were saying, they were denying his apostleship, saying that because of the fact that he had not conferred with the elders in Jerusalem, that he really wasn't a legitimate apostle. And so he starts out right away and he, declare, he declares to them who he is. Uh, and in the Greek word that he uses there, it has that emphasis that is one uh, with an official status who is provided with credentials to, of his office. In Acts 26, 16 through 18, and this is uh, Paul recounting his uh, conversion. In verse 16, he says, But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister. And of course, this is Jesus speaking to Paul, and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So as we read through this, it is our duty also to respect Paul's authority as an apostle. We do this by regarding this book as the word of God and taking it seriously to heart. The authority of Paul's apostleship was not from man, but uh, from and through Jesus and God. Paul not only denies that he was, has made, was made an apostle by men, but also denies that God used the intermediate agency of a man to constitute him as an apostle. His apostleship was not derived from a human source or given through a human channel. Jesus Christ and God the Father are not separated in his mind as sustaining different relationships to his apostleship, but are conceived of jointly and as sustaining one relation. So Paul makes it very clear that where his authority comes from, where his apostleship comes from, is directly through God and his son, Jesus Christ. In verse 2, he says, And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. So all the brethren that were with him, those would be, uh, at least those that we know of, would be Timothy and Silas and, uh, and, and such, and not the church that were with him. He says in verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So grace, the very thing, that he will communicate to them as the starting point and the ending point, and nothing should interfere with that. Peace, the typical greeting of the day. You can't know the peace of God without the grace of God. We talked about that on Sunday, a, quoted, a quote from John Chrysostom, an early church father, who says that grace is the fountain and peace is the stream that flows from it, and uh, how true that is. God's grace holds us to a much higher standard than that the law does. Grace holds us by strands of love empowered by the Holy Spirit, as we'll see when we get over into chapter 6. And it's true. You know, uh, 
when you think about, and, and we'll talk about this a whole lot more when we get into chapter five and chapter six about the purpose of the law uh, as our tutor to teach us that when we are doing something wrong, but grace teaches us that we need to obey God, not because of duty, but because of love. And that we have done things wrong, but yet God wants us to simply obey him because he loves us, he's forgiven us, and that it holds us to a deeper standard, a much deeper standard of obedience to God. When you think about that, because if, if we go by the law, we can just have our little check off, you know. Here, I did this one, I did that one, I did that one. You remember the rich young ruler in the gospel? The one that came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit the kingdom? And Jesus laid out all the law, well, most of the law for him. And he says, all that I have done, I've kept that from my youth. And he says, okay, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. And it says that it grieved him in his heart and he turned and he walked away sad. Why? Jesus pointed out, you have this, this law that you have broken which is covetousness, covetousness. And you've broken that law. We'll see later on in this book, Paul will tell the Galatians, that, and he'll tell us, that if you've broken one part of the law, you've broken the whole law. So it doesn't matter, you can keep it all. It's better to be under grace and understand that when you, when you do break the law, that forgiveness is available to us through the blood of Jesus Christ, but it requires an obedience. He, he who has, you know, been forgiven much must love much. And the more we recognize our own sin, the greater, I think, our love becomes. When we see that, how much God has forgiven me and what I deserved instead of what God has given me, it certainly brings me to that place where I just want to serve God even more with my life. In verse 4, he says, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us uh, from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So the source of the grace of God in our lives is that finished work of Christ. This was pur uh, purposely added because the Galatians were falling back on words or works, I'm sorry, as the ground of such acceptance. The voluntary aspect of the death of our Lord is brought out here so that we understand that it's all about a voluntary act of obedience on our part that God wants from us as well. But also that he did that so that we can, so that we can be forgiven, so that we can walk in his spirit and that he might deliver us from this present evil age. Deliver is a word which means to pluck out, to draw out, to rescue, uh, to deliver. The word strikes the keynote of the letter. The, the gospel is a rescue and emancipation from the state of bondage. The word here denotes not a removal from, but a rescue from the power of the ethical characteristics of this present age. Boy, talk about something that we need today, right? We need deliverance from the age in which we live in today, the bondage of sin. The word, um, the present evil age, as it says here, the King James uses the word, the world. Uh, Trench defines that as follows. He says, all that that floating mass of thoughts, opinions, maxims, speculations, hopes, impulses, aims, aspirations at any time current in the world, which it may be impossible to seize and to accurately define, but which constitute a most real and effective power, being the moral or immoral atmosphere, which at every moment of our lives we inhale again inevitably to exhale. That was a long definition. Uh, Trench was a Greek scholar, so uh, he, he writes like one. That's all I can say. The will of God is that we would be rescued from this evil age. The times that we live are really no different than the times of this epistle. Sin was dominating the culture and the lives of the people. So it is in ours as well. Paul is declaring that they were given this power through Jesus, and he is declaring that for us today as well. 
that we all can be delivered from the sin that captivates our heart and our life. Verse 6, he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Paul was amazed that they were turning away. The word marvel indicates that Paul expected more from them. Paul spent a great deal of time with them and had developed a close relationship with them. We see that in chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. He says, You know that because of physical infirmity I preached the gospel to you at the first, and my trial which was in my flesh you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. It speaks of the depth of the relationship that Paul had with them as he had shared the word of God, the gospel with them, and that they had given their hearts and lives to Christ. And obviously, Paul would have been preaching to them that idea of grace, the idea that we are not saved by works, but we are saved by grace through faith. And that he's, he's perplexed. How is it that you could turn so quickly back to that? And I, I've, I've got to tell you, it is, uh, it's always amazing how quickly people uh, can do that. They can get saved and be going right along the right track, get hooked up with the wrong group, and all of a sudden they're doing a lot of things that they should not be doing and trusting in a lot of things they should not. The word for turning away in other Greek literature was used for turncoat. The present tense indicates that when Paul wrote, the defection of the Galatians, uh, of the Galatians was yet only in progress. It hadn't come to its fruition yet. Had he used the perfect tense, that would have indicated that the Galatians had actually and finally turned against grace and had come to a settled attitude in the matter. So soon, he says, the word literally uh, means readily, rashly, quickly. And he speaks here of the, uh, the quickness with which the Galatians were turning away from Paul and his teachings of grace uh, to the Judaizers with their teachings of work, uh, works. And uh, he says, you're turning away from him who called you. God was the one who had called them, and by turning from grace to works, they were actually turning their backs on God. Um, and what was even more troubling is that they were turning to a different gospel, another gospel. Uh, the word for different is heteros. And it not only refers not only to difference in kind, but also speaks of the fact that the character of the thing is evil or bad. In verse 7 it says, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want you to pervert the gospel of Christ. Here Paul speaks of those of the Judaizers who had come in when he says, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4, uh, Paul, speaking to the Corinthians, says, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted uh, from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaching another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well be, you may well put up with it. And so he's talking to the Corinthians that they were susceptible to this very thing as well. And what they, the Galatians were doing, of course, is they were listening to these things. Today, there are those who teach a different gospel. Uh, there are obvious cults like Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Unitarians, Christian Science, and others. But there are those within the church that are like these in that they take away from the simplicity of the gospel. They add to it. Uh, and they take away from it as well. They defile the gospel by taking away from the essentials of the gospel, by denying doctrines of hell and the inerrancy of the scriptures, and the need to confess Christ as your savior. Unfortunately, I wish I could say that that was 
something that was dying out, but it's not. It's growing even more. Verse 8, but, we ha it, but if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. The word accursed is from anathema. It is a word used in the Septuagint of a person or thing set apart and devoted to destruction uh, because, hateful, because of being hateful to God. Hence, in a spiritual sense, it denotes one who is alienated from God by sin. The epistles of Paul attach to the word the idea of spiritual death. It is, its use in Romans 9.3, where Paul says that he could wish himself a curse from Christ for his brethren's sake, associates it with the further idea of separation from Christ and destruction for all eternity, which is the fate of the unsaved. In 1 Corinthians 6.22, it says, If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed, O Lord, come. In verse 9, it says, And we have said before, so we now say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. The word said before, uh, which means to say beforehand or to predict, and here have the idea of to say before in the sense of saying something in times past since it is used in contrast to the word now. The reference is not to verse 8, but to the previous time when Paul made this same statement. And the compound verb here and the words and, and now point necessarily to an earlier time in contrast to the present. So in teaching this, we often look at it as being a repeating of the words, uh, giving therefore emphasis, uh, a strong emphasis that Paul is saying, if somebody teaches you another gospel, then let them be accursed. And uh, I, I certainly believe there are those that are out there that teach another gospel. I believe that when there are those that, uh, well, I'm not going to go there. I, I changed my mind. <laughs> this explains why Paul's response seems to be so direct and to the point. He had warned them of these things, so he expected that, that they know not to receive their doctrines. It stands to reason that when Paul is there already within Paul's ministry, they've had problems with the Judaizers coming in. They'd experienced it in the church in Jerusalem. I mean, it, you know, it was all over the place. And so if Paul spending time with them, establishing the churches, he would have warned them. And he said, look, there's guys that are going to come and they're going to try to tell you these things. And it's amazing to me how often uh, lies appear to be so truthful that people are willing uh, to, to follow after them, even though it, it, it is unbiblical and, and certainly ungodly. Uh, but yet people will fall into that. There's something within us that, uh, that we love to earn what we get. It's a natural thing. Uh, you know, we love to feel worthy of receiving the love of God. It's a difficult thing for us to understand and to know we are not worthy and never will be worthy of God's love. And that's what makes it so phenomenal. That's what makes it so crazy is that the grace of God, which is, you know, poured out to us undeservedly. It's not because we were a great catch. I know I was. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a great catch, right? No, I'm not. I'm the worst one that God has. I'm so grateful for the grace of God. In the ESV version of this verse, it says, For I, uh, for am I now seeing the approval of man or... I'm sorry, I didn't read that, did I? Let me read verse 10. Then I'll give you the ESV version. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, would I not be, uh, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Well, in the ESV it says, for I am, for am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And it makes perfect sense. 
Uh, every once in a while, you hear me give a kudo to the ESV. Not very often. I don't like it. Uh, but uh, every once in a while, they do get it right, and I'll use it. But nonetheless, that's, that's me, okay? I'm not saying it's heretical, but it's close. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I don't really believe that. I just don't care for the translation. His enemies accused him of sacrificing the truth of God for the sake of conciliating men and winning their favor. It was Paul's boast that he became all things to all men, but his real purpose was to win all to Christ. You see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. They insinuated that he was more bent on obtaining the favor of men than securing the approval of God. He had made two concessions to Jewish uh, feelings. He had circumcised Timothy and had recommended for adoption certain regulations uh, tending to promote harmony between Jewish and Gentile converts. It was easy to misrepresent these concessions as an abandonment of his doctrine of salvation through grace alone. You know, that wasn't it at all. Uh, Paul told the Jews just as well as the Gentiles. There's only one way to be saved, and that's grace through faith. Now, you know, it is true, the first century church, they did not abandon uh, the, their Jewish uh, worship. They still went to temple up until 70 AD. Uh, they still went to synagogue. You know, they still practice uh, Shabbat, and Passover, you know, all the different holidays and different things. And that's perfectly okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that for Jews. Now, we, we do a Seder, we celebrate the Passover, but we make it very clear, we're not doing this in a religious observance of the law. We're doing it because, and we actually turn, turn, not turn it into, we point out that Jesus was the sacrificial lamb. So our Seder is a Christian Seder. We talk about the, the, the things that were foretold in the Passover of the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the Passover of the New Testament. And that's where we go with it. But we don't, rec we don't observe Sabbath. We don't do any of those things because we have been set free from that. Now, if a Jewish convert feels that they still have an obligation to those things, uh, as long as it's not to the law, but to the feast and so on, there's not a problem with that. If they're looking to the law to fulfill them and to give them their salvation, well, then they're misguided. And that's what was happening with these guys. And they had come in behind Paul, and they were convincing the people in the churches, both the practicing Jew, or the Jews, and also the Gentiles that were there. So you can see why it would catch on rather quickly. If you had, you have Jew and Gentile mixed within the church, you have a Jew that's come out of the law, who's now being told he doesn't have to depend upon the law anymore. But then there's that that's built within him from the time he's born to observe and obey the law. And so now when the Judaizers come in and say, yeah, you're a Christian, but now you need to observe the law too. They go, well, that makes perfect sense to me, right? And remember, I clarified that, right? Didn't I? It's okay to observe the, the, the holidays and all those different kind of things, but to observe the law as a source of righteousness in your life is completely contrary to the gospel of grace. In verse 11, he said, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. So Paul certified that the gospel did not originate with man. It was not man-made, uh, man-made religious emphasis, human merit, and necessity of human works for salvation. Paul's message did not speak that. It spoke of grace. Verse 12, for either... For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul declared that he did not receive the gospel from any human source. Though he heard Stephen preach and had personal contact with Ananias and Barnabas, he was not indebted to them for his knowledge of spiritual truth. The word revelation is from op. Apokalopto. <laughs> Try that one. 
uh, three times, very fast, uh, which originally referred primarily to the removal of what uh, that which conceals and uncovering. In other words, it was that, that revelation of Jesus Christ, that it was an unveiling in Paul's heart and his mind. And we'll see, he tells us in this book that uh, he goes out and hangs out in the desert for a while. And the Lord ministers to him, showing him. You know, Paul was the perfect candidate for the job. He had an incredible knowledge of the law of God and the Old Testament, not just the Pentateuch, not just the five books of the Bible, the whole entirety of the law. Paul had it down. I want you to think about this. There's a few people in my life that have really just amazed me uh, by their abilities to be able to know and to memorize. Uh, you know, I think of, um, uh, Oh, I can't think of his first name. Haley, Haley's Handbook. Haley's Handbook. Can't think of his first name. That guy, before he died, he memorized almost the entire Bible. Genesis to Revelation. I think there was like one book in there that he had not memorized. And that, that just absolutely blows me away to be able to memorize something like that. And then one of my teachers when I was in Bible school, he uh, started out after he got saved, he got hooked up with the navigators. And if you know anything about the navigators, their whole thing is scripture memorization. That's what you do when you're a navigator. And he, at that time, had memorized the entire uh, New Testament, uh, excluding the Gospels, and was working on the book of Revelation at the time when, when he taught in the school. And it was amazing as he sat there with his Bible clothes and taught us the book of Ephesians and never opened it and he quoted it word for word all the way through teaching the Bible. I'm amazed at that kind of memory. I'm amazed at that, that kind of discipline to do that. But, I, you know, you, you got to think about this. Paul, his memorization came not because he had little cards in his pocket and he was able to pull them out and quote chapter and verse. He memorized the scrolls. He knew the Word of God in and out. And, and he knew where it was in the scroll and all that, all that kind of stuff. He was the perfect candidate for God to choose to be the one that would go out and do this job that he currently has been doing. And so Paul, when he answers back to them about the fact that, that you know, as the, um, his, those that are criticizing him, his critics, uh, as they're doing that and they're trying to say that Paul wasn't worthy, you know, he wasn't really um, capable of this kind of authority and so on and so forth, Paul makes sure that they understand that that's not true. His authority comes from Jesus Christ. And he spent time with Jesus Christ. And in that time with Jesus Christ, just like it was with the guys on the road to Emmaus, as he began, he opened up the scriptures and began to show them throughout the scriptures who, that it was he whom they were talking to, that Jesus was the Messiah. You can only imagine the conversation that went on between Jesus and Paul. You know, I love chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians where we do communion there because Paul makes it very clear. He wasn't there that night when they had communion. He wasn't there when, when Jesus established that. He says, but the night, he, he says, and this is what the Lord showed me. This is what the Lord told me. And he nails it, just like all the other fellas, right? Good stuff. So there's this unveiling that takes place. Um, Jesus is still revealing himself to us. You know, this is the whole thing. We have to understand that as, as we walk in this world throughout our life and we follow after Christ, there will be not this great overwhelming revelation. And if you got something different than everybody else got, you better check yourself because you're probably wrong. If nobody else has already found it, then there's something, you know, you, you got to check what you're doing. And believe me, I say that because there are a lot of people out there that believe that they do, you know. Uh, back in the 70s, there were a bunch of guys known as the Kansas City Prophets who thought that they had direct revelation from God and that there was revelation beyond the Word of God. And that's how they came up with all these wonderful things like, you know, roaring like lions, barking like dogs, soaring like eagles, gold uh, uh, amalgamum fillings becoming gold. And I mean, all these false doctrines that had come out from these guys who called themselves apostles the Kansas City prophets. And it's a part of the apostolic movement today. Again, 
You know, old lies have a way of coming right back up to the surface again. It just takes a little time, and they'll rear their ugly heads up once again. And so God is always revealing himself more in greater depth to us, but it's always going to be found within the scriptures, clearly delineated. And if you've got something that's really out there, then you really need to check yourself. Verse 13, for you have heard my form of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of, of my fathers. So here we see Paul's pointing to his changed life as evidence uh, that these things are true that he's sharing with them. Verse 15, that when it pleased God to separate me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his, his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. So Paul makes it very clear when he had said that no man had a part in this, it was God himself that revealed these things to her, to him, that this is what took place. And you know, when you look at this as Paul begins to tell us about his past, I think it's wonderful for us to look back and see God's hand in our lives even before we confessed him as Lord. You know, I can easily do that. As a matter of fact, this beautiful woman that I am married to, I am convinced to this day that it was God's hand that brought us together. Even though we did not know Christ, God knew that our hearts one day would know Christ and that we would know Christ together. And that his providential providence for us, I guess that's kind of redundant, right? Uh, but nonetheless, that we can see the hand of God. And, and we didn't know it. And as a matter of fact, we, you know, as we look back in our life, we can see the fingerprints of God all over us all the time. And you should be able to. And if you can't, then I got to ask, you know, what's your relationship with God? Right? Because as far as my relationship with God, he's working with me every day. Every day. Every day that I will come to him, he will work with me and he will minister to my heart and my life and change me from within. So Paul had been set apart from birth, as he says here. He knew that God had providentially set him apart from birth and that all his life to this point was a preparation for his ministry as a proclaimer of the gospel of God's grace. Also, Paul call, uh, God Paul, called Paul by his grace uh, and this is a reference to the time of Paul's salvation. He responded to God's uh, efficacious, yeah, e efficacious, I'm sorry, call and received Jesus Christ as Savior. In Romans 8.30, Paul gave the sequence of God's work in salvation. He said, those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. God working within our lives always. Also, thirdly, we see here in verse 16 that God was pleased to reveal his son uh, in Paul. Blinded as he had been to the deity of Christ and thinking that uh, the Nazarene was a fraud, God gave Paul an outward vision of Christ on the Damascus road and later an, inward, an inner revelation concerning the full significance of the person and work of the Savior. The purpose of this revelation was that Paul might preach among the Gentiles. And then he tells us, nor did I go up to Jerusalem. So when he got saved, he didn't just go running up to Jerusalem where all the other boys were. He said to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So Paul had emphasized that he did not receive the message from men uh, before or at the time of his conversion. Now he affirmed that he was free from human influences after as well. And though Paul met other Christians after his conversion, he did not consult them on doctrine. If he had been uncertain about the gospel, he could readily have gone to Jerusalem for a seminar with the apostles. But he did not. Rather, he went immediately into Arabia. 
it is doubtful that he went there to evangelize, but rather to be away from men and alone with the Lord for personal study, meditation, and to receive further revelation from Christ. This zealous student of the law now pondered the meaning of his conversion and looked for the things concerning Christ in the Old Testament. The product of these days in Arabia was the Christian theology that Paul explained in his epistle to the Romans. The point of Paul's declaration is clear. He formed his theology not by consulting with others, but independently as he sought God's guidance. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. So Paul then reinforces his previous argument by asserting that he waited three years after his conversion to go to Jerusalem, time that was spent in Arabia and Damascus. Um, would he have waited for a long time if he had needed theological instruction? I don't think so. And when he, he did go, it was to get acquainted with Peter, and that is, that is it, a personal visiting visit lasting only 15 days. Paul then left because of a plot against his life. We find that in Acts chapter 9, verse 29. Verse 19, but I saw none of the other apostles except James and the Lord's brother. And now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God I do not lie. Of the rest of the apostles, Paul met only James, the Lord's brother, a leader in the church in Jerusalem. To stress the truth of what he had just said, no doubt in the face of the Judaizers. Um, and so he's defending his apostleship at this time. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was known, unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. So after his abbreviated visit in Jerusalem, Paul worked for an extended time in Syria and Sicilia, Sicilia sorry, uh, which is why uh, he was personally unknown to the churches of Judea because that's where the happening thing was going on. All the churches were being established in the Judean area, uh, and the, the word traveled fast among the churches and the different things that are going on, but Paul was outside of that. He was off doing his own thing, if you will. Verse 23, but they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us uh, now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy and they glorified God in me. So the churches in Judea by the, his time had almost forgotten Paul. You remember early on, it had come to their attention who he was, but then he had left for a number of years, and by this time they just simply forgot who he was. The only report that they had recently heard was that this one who had once persecuted the church was now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. This, of course, include the doctrine of justification by faith, apart from circumcision or works. And in the face of this report, the Judean believers praised God because of Paul. And this was a telling blow to the false teachers. The Jewish Christians in Judea rejoiced in the same gospel that the Judaizers sought to undermine. And so, uh, Paul in this chapter, of course, defends himself as to what uh, his credentials are and what the truth is and to warn others from getting into false doctrines. And uh, I truly believe that that is uh, a good message for us today. Be careful. Don't get into false doctrines. Don't believe everything you hear, even though they might be a good, that they might be very charismatic and very believable. Check what they say. Be a Berean. Know what you believe and why you believe it. And look into the Word of God and trust it alone and faith in God. And not works. Not works. By the time we get into chapters 5 and 6, we'll address the whole issue that just because Paul is saying faith, uh, you know, grace by faith and faith alone, not of works, lest anyone should boast, it doesn't mean that the law does not have a place in the believer's life. And we'll talk about that because it certainly does even to this day. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Go with us now, and I pray, God, uh, get us all home safely. Pray, Lord, the, st the storm's not too great, uh, and that uh, we get a good night's rest and get up and get to start our day with you all over again. Father, we love you and we praise you. We lift these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.